talking formats faster than you can follow, perhaps. But uh, next up is an interview, an interview by um, Nikki Natarajan of Phoenix. And she'll be grilling Declan O'Brien of UBS. And, and the subject will be driving towards a sustainable future, decarbonizing transport. Declan, Nikki, where are you? Good morning and welcome to this all too important session on decarbonizing transport. I'm delighted to be joined by Declan O'Brien, Executive Director within the Energy and Transport Transition Team at UBS Asset Management. You can read his detailed and very interesting biography on your app, but just to set the scene, Declan has been with UBS for six years and was formerly their Head of Infrastructure Research. He has been in infrastructure, energy, transition sector for 18 years, covering investing, banking, research, and credit. Um, he's a member of the ACA and holds a CFA Institute certificate in ESG investing. Achieving net zero by 2050 might seem far off, but as we all know, instigating change takes time. And nowhere is it going to be harder and yet more important to manage than the transport sector. Declan will have much better statistics, but at a glance, it looks like the transport sector, including shipping, electric vehicles, trucks, buses, cars, vans, rail, aviation, account for more than a third of carbon emissions globally. And transport continues to rely on oil products for something like 90% of its final energy, which shows the scale of the problem, but also of the opportunities. Just before we kick off, just to get an idea of the makeup of the room, can you raise a red card if you have I forgot the things. Um, if you're interested in decarbonizing um, surface transportation, if that's your area of interest. Only one person. Oh, excellent. Blue card, and you can keep them all up for the decarbonization of maritime transportation. Great. And yellow for air transport. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you. Declan. There are a lot of opportunities within the energy transition, so why have you focused your career on transport? Yeah, thank you, Nikki, and I think it's still about good morning, and apologies, I think we're standing between you and your lunch. Um, but you're right, you know, clearly investors have lots of opportunities across the energy transition, and, and as an investor, I tend to look at, you know, three key areas, you know, where can I get the most impact from my dollars invested? Can it be a solution at scale? and how can I invest without taking on you know, too much risk? And in terms of impact, transportation is attractive on a CO2 reduced per dollar invested basis. For more analysis, especially in countries where the grid is clean, transportation can, have a, can often have a higher impact in terms of CO2 reduced per dollar invested than conventional renewables like solar, wind, and energy storage. And you know, when we look at it uh, all in all, we can see that you know, almost 70% of the investment has gone into that space. Transportation has been historically underinvested. It still makes up 23% of global CO2 emissions, and that, scale, that, that actual scale is increasing. And we estimate that overall it needs a trillion of investment to 20, 2050 to fully decarbonize transport. So it can really provide that impact, that scale. And I think Roger from EIF in the opening um, ceremony said, you know, we need solutions at scale. So I think that's where transportation really um, stacks up. And we believe it's really at the start of a multi-decade um, transition. And if I draw your attention um, to the slide on the, on the right, you can see that electrified transport, which is highlighted here in orange, was actually the largest segment of the energy transition in 2023, actually larger, larger than the whole of the renewable sector. You know, so clearly an, an important overall sector. And the ramp up in investment in transportation is really driven by three key tailwinds. You've got you know, falling technology cost, battery costs are around 90% lower than they were a decade ago. You've also got the carrot and stick approach from regulators. You've got the carrot in terms of support supportive regulation like the Inflation Reduction Act, the European Green Deal, which is encouraging investment, but you've also got to stick in terms of increasing regulation 
It's more expensive now to drive internal combustion engine or ICE vehicles in urban settings. You've got ultra low emission zones. You've got transportation being added to the European emission trading scheme. And finally, it's the stakeholder pressure that, that, that demand for cleaner you know, goods and, and services and transportation, as you mentioned, is clearly a big component of that. So I've touched on, I guess, how we you know, can have impact. You know, we, we talked about the dollars per uh, CO2 per dollar invested. We know it's a big asset class, but how do we access this sector without taking on you know, too much risk? And for this, we need to look at the subsectors of transportation, which you can see on the right. So the, and it was interesting to see the cards at the start. Uh, actually, maritime is the smallest um, segment of the, uh, the three major sectors. Uh, then you have aviation making up 12% of emissions, and surface transport actually makes up the lion's share of emissions at 70% of total emissions, and that's highlighted uh, in the orange circle. And there are options to decarbonize each of these sectors, but the solutions are at various stages of maturity uh, and also in terms of cost. And we believe in order to decarbonize quickly and at scale, the low carbon option should be cost competitive with the, you know, the legacy fuel or the fossil fuel uh, option. And the technology also needs to be commercially available. You know, we therefore believe actually that surface transport is where the key focus should be uh, because it can be decarbonized today using commercially available technologies in an economically sensible way. Without, and what I mean by that is it doesn't need ongoing revenue subsidies in order to you know, make sense as an investment. And that ultimately reduces the risk for investors because you know, they're not exposed to governments changing policy risks you know, midway through the investment cycle, and you're not also exposed to technological obsolescence as well. Okay, thank you. Let's focus a little bit on this. What do the decarbonizing solutions look like across the sectors? It's quite different, actually, across the different sectors. So I'll probably start with the most challenging sectors first. Um, to decarbonize maritime and air uh, in, in the short term are actually quite difficult. I'll then touch on this, this surface segment, which I mentioned is, is more of an immediate um, opportunity. If I look at maritime first, most of the emissions are generated, I think almost 90% are generated from the long distance uh, vessel. So things like your container ships, your cargo, sh uh, your uh, bulk carriers, your tankers. And these are very difficult to electrify. And there's not really an obvious decarbonization solution today. You've got Maersk who are looking at you know, e-methanol, others are looking at ammonia as a long-term solution. And this uncertainty creates a risk of a stranded acid. And until we, you know, the industry lands at a, a, an overall solution, it makes it quite unattractive for, you know, for institutional investors to, to, you know, to put money to work in decarbonizing that particular sector. But actually, in Europe, 6 to 8% of the emissions come from ports. And ports are very easy to decarbonize today. You can replace you know, the terminal tractors, the stackers, uh, with low carbon equivalents. You can also electrify the ports by providing onshore power. So that means that when you know, vessels come into the port, they can plug into clean power when they're berthed. And instead of running auxiliary generators to power the ship's infrastructure, they can actually use clean, clean power. So that's something which is addressable today. For the aviation sector, only a small portion of the aircraft can be electrified. And the only way to materially decarbonize the air sector is through sustainable aviation fuel or SAF. And some of you in the room might be surprised to hear that less than 0.01% of the jet fuel consumed globally is actually sustainable aviation fuel. Despite what you know, we often see when we're getting on a flight, a sticker saying this flight is powered by sustainable aviation fuel. Um, and when you look at the, where that comes from, Almost all of it's coming from Haifa, which is mostly used cooking oil. Now, unfortunately, in order to scale sustainable aviation fuel, there's not enough sustainable sources to do that. So the only way you can do it is through green hydrogen at scale. And cost estimates vary, but it's anywhere from between three to five times the cost of jet fuel. So even to get to that kind of 2% level in Europe by 2025 is quite a, quite a challenge for the industry. 
I mean, I mentioned about maritime and, and air difficult to decarbonize in the short term, but there's a huge opportunity within surface transport. As I said, most of the sector can be decarbonized today using commercially available technology and it can be done in an economically sensible way. And it's already happening. You can see in the personal auto space that almost 16% of the vehicle sales in 2023 were electric. But what we're seeing in the commercial segment is there are some barriers to adoption. We have less than 3% of sales are electric uh, in that segment. Um, and we see the two key barriers there are the, the upfront capex and the inconvenience. The upfront capex because in almost all cases the low carbon equivalent is more expensive than the ICE version upfront. So in, for example a terminal tractor that operates at ports is double the cost of a internal combustion engine equivalent. But importantly over the life of that vehicle in, you know, including the maintenance and the savings in fuel costs, it's actually 40% cheaper, excluding any subsidies, of which there are subsidies that are plentifully available. And then you have the inconvenience of moving from a, a fossil fuel system where you can refuel wherever and wherever you want to a low carbon system where you need to think about which vehicles do I buy? Do I need fast chargers or slow chargers? Do I have enough power at my depot? And, you know, so I think there are the real challenges, but Fortunately, those barriers are eminently you know, solvable. The upfront capex is not so big an issue because as I mentioned, we've got a 40% saving over the life of the vehicle. So from an economic point of view, it makes sense for the, for the end user. And the inconvenience can also be addressed by you know, getting an end-to-end -end solution that means that that fleet user doesn't have to manage the whole system themselves. And additionally, the tech is already available to decarbonize most of the surface sector. And even in that commercial segment, 60 to 75% of commercial freight trips are less than 400 kilometers. And there is technology available um, and many electric versions that are less than, 40, less than 400 kilometers. And for those that are more than 400 kilometers, you can use biomethane, you can use um, hydrogen. But I wanted to just show you a chart on the next slide, and it's quite a busy chart. Um, but this shows you really why battery electric vehicle is so much more efficient than, than the alternatives and why we think it's a clear winner in the surface space. So at the top of the chart you can see uh, a battery electric vehicle system and at the bottom it's a hydrogen system. In both cases we start with 100 kilowatt hours of electricity. And on the top when you run it through your transmission and your charger, you end up with 87, 85 kilowatt hours. So you lose 15% through that process before it gets to the vehicle. The equivalent hydrogen system, you end up with 57. And that's even before you get to the vehicle. So the second part of the story is the battery electric vehicle is much more efficient than internal combustion engine. It's more than three times efficient, but it's also more efficient than a fuel cell electric vehicle, which is at the bottom. So with that 100 kilowatt hours, you can drive two and a half times the distance in a battery electric vehicle versus a hydrogen vehicle. So Bruno um, gave us uh, previously quite a sort of in-depth thing of how investors can access sort of, in his case, the climate tech. In, within the transport sector, how can investors access this opportunity? Yep, sure. Um, so this is just a very kind of simple slide. And I mentioned at the outset, you know, you need to consider what your impact objectives are, but you also need to try and access the opportunity without taking on too much risk. So this is a simple chart that shows along the x-axis the different risk profile from, you know, venture capital all the way to, um, you know, a yield-focused infrastructure approach. And on the y-axis we've got a yield as a percentage of, of total returns. Now, most of the capital, sorry, so you've got on the far end of the, the side venture capital. So here it's obviously the highest risk return uh, proposition. Here you might be investing into things like new battery chemistries or gigafactories. And then in the center of the chart, you've got what, where a lot of the private equity and infrastructure capital flows are going, which is a lot of is rolling out um, EV charging systems and, and networks. Um, so that might be an example of that, might be putting a, an EV charger into every lamppost in Amsterdam, for example. And with that model, you take two main risks. You take you know, the ramp up risk. How quickly are people gonna buy electric vehicles? 
And then you take the utilization risk. Are they gonna use your particular lamppost? How long are they gonna stay for? Are they gonna park there for 24 hours so that nobody else you know, can, can use, that, use that model? And that model really is mostly a capital growth model. So your returns will mostly come from growing the asset base. And then you've got on the fire side, you know, the yield focused infrastructure approach. And here you create defensive infrastructure features by using the three kind of elements below to create yield. So you can partner with large, high quality credit counterparties. And these are the ones that have the most ambitious net zero targets. So your big fleet users across logistics, across you know, uh, maritime, aviation, et cetera. You can invest into closed loop systems. So I mentioned about you know, the, the lamppost model. That's an open system. You're exposed to all the externalities of the market. In a closed system, it's something like a back-to-base charging model. So in a depot, you would you know, charge your vehicles at point A, then that vehicle delivery van delivers at point B, C, D, and E, and it comes back to A to charge. So you're not exposed to the public charging network. You can, you can basically decarbonize the system. And then finally, um, proven technology, and we touched on this already in terms of you know, the technology being, being available. So not taking um, not taking technology bets. And this model can really be applied across surface, maritime, and air, but electric surface maritime is where it makes most sense today because that's where the largest um, counterparties are and that's where the technology is really proven. But it's important to say that the market needs all of these buckets of capital, right, to, to decarbonize. But some of those, you know, maritime and air sector is gonna be a little bit further down the line, I think, before it hits that that scale that, that we can use. And I just, you know, maybe finish in saying that, you know, we're really excited about the transportation opportunity because of the opportunity to have carbon abatement, you know, at scale that, that we mentioned. Um, you know, we clearly can't cover everything today, but, you know, very happy to take Q&A if we have time. We also have uh, an, an area in the, in, in the networking area, very happy to continue the conversation. And we have some investor connect knots if anybody wants to, to catch up. Thank you, Declan. We actually do have time. Um, I've got loads of questions, but I just want to see if anyone in the audience got some questions for Declan. I think this is such an important topic. Um, details maybe of investments or um, challenges. Oh, no questions. Oh, there is a question. Just if you can just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Matthew Gardner, A1AI. Just wondering uh, what your most ambitious investment is in this space and the least ambitious one? Deliberately naive question, but... Did you get the question? I, I couldn't hear the question. Sorry, uh, uh, the most ambitious investment and the least ambitious one. Yeah, I, would, I mean, I would say that, you know, all of the investments that, you know, we're looking at in this space are you know, ambitious in the sense of, of the scale because of the types of counterparties that, that we're involved uh, in discussing with across, you know, whether it be logistics space, whether it be port operator, whether it's ground support uh, equipment provider, these are all kind of, you know, large multinational companies and they're all at the start of their decarbonization journey. So, you know, if you look today in the commercial vehicle um, segment, 99% of the stock is uh, diesel or internal combustion engine. And depending on what part of the world you are, by 2035, 2040, 2045, 100% of those sales are gonna to need to be low carbon. So you basically need to turn over the entire fleet over the next two to three decades. So I think that for me is, is very ambitious in terms of what needs to be done. And you know, when I look at the sector overall, there's a lot of, you know, um, there's a lot of focus on maybe you know, some of the sectors that are really difficult to abate you know, as I mentioned, sustainable aviation fuel, you know, uh, aviation makes up 12% uh, of overall emissions. That's really difficult to do because, you know, electrolyzers are not yet proven at scale. The cost is really difficult, but you've got 70% of emissions in the surface segment where actually the solutions are relatively uh, that bit easier than um, some of the other sectors. So depends what you mean in terms of ambitious. Is it ambitious in terms of the impact you can you can make or is ambitious in terms of let's try and do something that's extremely difficult to do um, then you know there's different definitions of what ambitious can mean did that answer your question like uh, it's 
very difficult to hear up here. So, so a very intense period in the next five years. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Any other questions? We're ne nearly at the end of the time, but I have a question. Just, yep. I was actually quite surprised when you said that maritime is actually not as big as a uh, sort of portion of all the emissions. But we've, we've obviously got the issue of war. Um, I, had, I would have had a question if you had uh, brought something up about politics, but war seems to be um, causing, obviously, the Suez Canal, all the boats are taking the um, longer routes around the Cape of Good Hope, and some of the companies, I believe, are stopping their sort of climate policies. How is this affecting sort of the projects to go forward, and how can you sort of go, go beyond this? Yeah, I think that the maritime sector, sector is really, really interesting because in terms of the scale of the opportunity, it's, uh, it, it's very large in terms of replacing those, those vessels. The way the industry has been dealing with, you know, the IMO regulation that's come in has been around some efficiency measures, but the main measure has been slow steaming, which in common language just means slowing down. And so if your normal route takes you 10 days, you might do it in seven days. And then, you know, for every 10% reduction in speed, you get a 19% reduction in emissions uh, in that kind of range. Now, obviously what, what's happened now is that it means that they're taking a longer route from Asia to Europe, uh, and in order to make up for the fact it's a longer route, then they're speeding up the, the, the vessels to previous speeds or potentially even a, a higher speed, which is you know, having a huge spillover in emissions. And I guess it comes back to, you know, maybe paper, you know, slow steaming is a bit papering over the cracks, and it's not a long-term solution. I think the long-term solution is obviously going to be lower carbon vessels. But as I mentioned, from an industry point of view, it's very difficult for the ship owners and for institutional investors to make that investment until the industry lands on a, a common uh, agreement on what the best way forward for the, uh, to de decarbonize those vessels. Thank you, Declan. And we've run out of time, so I just wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. We've got a long way to go, but lots of opportunities. If you could join me in giving uh, Declan a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.